Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. Assalamu alaikum. I call on Malana Kari Hafez Faisal Rahman of Pakistan, presently based at Darul Ulum Chatsworth, Unit 7, to recite the Qur'at. Jazakallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن ألم تر أن أرسل الشياطين على الكافرين ألم تر أن أرسل الشياطين على الكافرين تؤزهم أزا فلا تعجل يوم نحشر المتقين إلى الرحمن وفدا ونسوق المجرمين يوم نحشر المجرمين يوم 
Rahim. I seek refuge in Allah from the rejected Satan 
And I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Respected ulama, respected elders, brothers and sisters. It is a privilege for me to welcome you and to introduce to you our chairman for today, a promising and successful young man. In fact, Islam requires us to be successful. Five times a day in the Azan, the call to prayer, Allah reminds us to come to prayer, come to success. And this successful young man is Muhammad Salim Khan. He is a lawyer, an academic, and a lecturer at the University of Durban Restful. His faculty is law. Brothers and sisters, I'd like you to meet our chairman, Brother Muhammad Salim Khan. Brother Salim. Thank you. Peace be upon you and the mercy of God. This translated into Arabic reads, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, that this symposium is God ordained is indisputable by all those who believe in God. This begs the question, why are we present here? Why is it that of the millions of people in this world, you in particular have been destined to attend this symposium? The definite answer to that question rests with Allah alone. However, this does not preclude us from questioning, from inquiring, in order to establish the purpose of your attendance here this afternoon. For it is only through serious inquiry, positive questioning, can one aspire to enlightenment and thence appreciate the greatness of our Creator. To my mind, ladies and gentlemen, and I sub submit this respectfully, we are here this afternoon to be educated and possibly to educate. The path to education is one paved with humility. In order to aspire to any great heights in education, in any facet or in any sphere, one must be able to acquire certain characteristics. Firstly, one must be able to shed off the bondage of skepticism. One must be able to shed off the bonds of subjectivity. One must be able to analyze issues objectively. Ladies and gentlemen, that objectivity is important, is trite. However, immaterial, how compelling an argument is. If a person does not want to accept, if he does not want to accept a conversion of his ideas or beliefs, he will not be converted. For Allah clearly indicates in the Holy Quran that it is for him to convert ideas, it is for him to convert ideals. I'm not suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, that one should reject or abandon one's innate beliefs. What I am merely submitting is that one should not allow one's innate beliefs and one's subjectivity to prevent one from analyzing someone else's belief, from analyzing someone else's argument, even if ultimately it resulted in the rejection of this other person's argument. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a gathering, a symposium of goodwill. It, a, it is a coming together of different religions, Islam, Christianity, and possibly aspects relating to Judaism. That these religions are similar begs of no doubt. They are like peas in the same pod, yet they are characterized by certain differences. It is hoped that in symposiums of this nature, in conferences and in discussions, there will be a resolve effectuated to these differences. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasant task of being chairman this afternoon. It is indeed our privilege to have with us this afternoon our very own Mr. Ahmed Didat, an eminent scholar of religion, a person who is responsible for a number of publications, an author of publications, a person of international repute, one who has especially in recent days acquired great renown. It is also our privilege to have a visitor from Canada who will be introduced to yourselves in due course. He too is a very prominent personality, one whose reputation precedes him, and we shall have the benefit of his knowledge this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Mr. Ahmed Didat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Mr. Chairman and brethren, Bodley, B-O-D-L-E-Y, Bodley, the American, in his book, The Messenger, he gives the relative strength of two of the mightiest religious forces on earth today, those of Islam and Christianity. He doesn't give us figures. He does not tell us that the Muslims today number a thousand million and the Christians 1,200 million. But what he says is that these Muslims and Christians who are competing for the allegiance of mankind, that they, he says, that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. Meaning that the number of people who tick off on census forms as Christians, there will be more of that than those who tick themselves off as Muslims that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. But, he says, there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians. If I said this on my own account, <laughs> blowing my own trumpet, would not have carried much weight. It makes me happy to quote an outsider, an American and a Christian at that. What is really the difference between Islam and Christianity? I may share with you that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. What he is made to believe is that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He is made to believe that he was the Messiah. He is made to believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe today. And he is made to believe, the Muslim is made to believe that Jesus Christ, he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. He gets all this from his book of authority, the Holy Quran. It is your privilege to get one. The MYM bookstall in the corner there, they are selling them for five rands each. 2,000 pages, an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages for five rands each. You will agree with me, this is very, very cheap. And if you can't afford it, Muslim as well as non-Muslim, you can write to the Islamic Propagation Center and tell us that, look, I'm earning 500 rands a month, but I can't afford a Quran, and you will get one by return post. Tell us why we should give you one for nothing. 
I'm not talking about the cultists, the born-again missionary. Look, he must pay for it, as we have to pay for the Bibles from the Bible house. But I'm talking about the general public. If you're interested in knowing the Quran, and if you can't afford it, write for one and get one free. Now, the points of real difference, what are the only, the only points of real differences between the Muslim and the Christian is this, are these. Number one, the Muslim says that Jesus is not God. Number two, the Muslim says that Jesus is not the begotten Son of God because God does not beget. The Muslim says that God is not a triune God because there is no such thing as three in one and one in three. The Muslim says that Jesus Christ was not killed nor crucified and hence he was not resurrected. There is no such thing as a resurrection. These are points of real differences between the Muslim and the Christian. But believe me, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, that this wide gulf between the Muslim and the Christian, between Islam and Christianity is being rapidly bridged. The Christians are coming towards Islam. I'm not talking about the cultists. I'm talking about the learned men of Christianity who are described in the Holy Quran in these beautiful words. I'm quoting from Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 85. It says, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ and nearest to them, among them in faith, in love, and nearest among them in love to the believers, to the Muslims, will thou find those who say we are Christians. Because amongst them are men devoted to learning. Among the Christians, says the Holy Quran, are men devoted to learning. Waruh and men who have renounced the world. Wa annahum la yastakbirun, and people who are not arrogant. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, the commentator of this translation which I was showing it to you, in his note number 789, on this verse comments. He says, the meaning is not that they call themselves Christians, but they are such sincere Christians that they appreciate Muslim virtues, as did the Abyssinians to whom Muslim refugees went during the persecution in Mecca. They would say, it is true we are Christians, but we understand your point of view, and we know you are good men. Abdullah Yusuf Ali concludes that these Christians, they are Muslims at heart. That these Christians, they are Muslims at heart. Never mind whatever label they apply for themselves. And I can give you many examples from history of this type of good learned men among the Christians. But time is short. So let me give you some brief references from recent times. Number one, in the Time magazine, July 15, 1974, there were a series of essays under the heading, Who are History's Great Leaders? And among the contributors, there is one, James Gavin, described as a retired um, a commander of chief, a commander in chief of the American army. This James Gavin, in his list of the most, the greatest leaders, he says, number one, Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and number two, he puts his own Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Number two. Then, in America again, an American by the name of Michael H. Hart of the Hart Publishing Company, described as an astronomer and a mathematician, this man, he writes a book of 572 pages, giving the most influential men in history from the time of Adam up to current times. 
and in his list of 100 most influential men, he puts the holy prophet of Islam, Muhammad, number one. And surprisingly, he puts his own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, number three. Then that is going a bit far. Coming back to our own country, the charming Bill Chalmers, he will be on TV tonight, on what is called cross questions, he will be on TV tonight. This Bill Chalmers, at the end of a lively debate on the subject of Islam and Christianity, the very subject of this afternoon, afternoon's discussion, it was on SABC TV, Islam and Christianity. He commented at the end of the talk in these charming words. Well, I think it can be said from this discussion that there is, at present, somewhat more accommodation on the Islamic side for the founder of Christianity than there is on the Christian side for the founder of Islam. What the significance of that is, we leave it to you, the viewer, to determine. But I do hope you will agree with us that it's a good thing that we are talking together. Good. He said, I think it can be said from this discussion, referring to the discussion on TV, that there is at present somewhat more accommodation on the Islamic side for the founder of Christianity than there is on the Christian side for the founder of Islam. That there is more tolerance, there is more compassion on the Islamic side for Jesus Christ than there is on the Christian side for the founder of Islam. He said, what the significance of that is, we leave it to you, the viewer, to determine. But I do think you will agree with me that it is a good thing that we are talking together. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, you are all privileged to see that videotape of that meeting, Islam and Christianity, that great debate that took place on TV. You are privileged to see that tape absolutely free of charge on VHS or Betamax, whatever you choose, whatever format, absolutely free of charge if you want to see it, you can see it. You can get it from the propagation center. But you will have to put with us 25 rand security deposit. Because after giving this tape to you, we haven't got the manpower to start running behind you to find out where you are with this tape. So you leave with us 25 rand security. After a week, you return it and take your money back in full. We don't hire it, we will lend it to you. And on that, on this program, you will see something more than what Bill Chalmers tells you. You see, you will find on this tape the reason why Bill Chalmers says, you know, that there is more sympathy from the Islamic side than there is on the Christian side towards Islam. You will find a classical example of a sickness. You see, there is a current sickness prevailing among the Christians of the world. They call it a born again. It's a cult that has been created recently, where they now say that, look, previously with the disciples of Jesus, they had the spirit with them, but now they say we have it in us. The spirit is in them, inside, fills them up. And I had one of these sick persons coming to my office, wanting to share this sickness with me. I asked him, now you have the spirit in you? He said, yes. I said, it permeates every fiber of your being. He said, yes. So I said, you can't be tempted. If the spirit of God fills you up, is there room for the devil to get in? He says, no. So I said, you can't be tempted. He says, no. So I said, congratulations. Congratulations. I said, you know, you're great, greater than your own God. You're greater than your own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil, and you can't be tempted. Amazing. You can't be tempted, but Jesus was tempted. So he said, no, 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 I can also be tempted. Then I said, in that case, you haven't got the spirit. He says, either way, if you have the spirit, then you are greater than Jesus. Because Jesus was tempted, his disciples were tempted. You are greater than them all. And if you are, if you can be tempted, then you haven't got the spirit. Rather, you have something rightly described by the holy prophet of Islam. 
he said that shaitan shaitan the spirit of evil courses through the body of man like the blood this is what shaitan is coursing through the body of man like the blood as the blood is flowing in your veins this devilishness this evil inclinations temptations are also coursing through your body so somebody asked him he said what about you and he was humble enough to admit he said me too but mine is under control so talking about these learned christians i said there are these learned christians they are coming towards islam is the learned men not sick people our biggest points of differences between the christian and ourselves things that greeted the muslim most was this expression that jesus is the only begotten son begotten not made this would be getting was greeting the muslims and it is greeting according to the recitation read by waqari he read those words very strong words he says waqalu takhaza arrahmanu walada and they say that arrahman the merciful god he has begotten a son allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god almighty he says in answer to that he says laqad ji'tum shay'an idda it's one of the most abominable assertion one can make takadu samawatu yatafattarna minhu at it the skies are ready to burst watan shaqqal ardu and the earth to split asunder wata khirru aljibal hadda and the mountains to fall down in utter ruin such a horrible swearing that you say that god begot a son because begetting is an animal act it belongs to the lower animal functions of sex how can you attribute such a quality to god so the learned men of christianity 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations of the christians they went and produced the revised standard version of the bible and they threw this word begotten out unceremoniously this word begotten in john 3:16 every christian with the name knows it the most translated sentence of any sentence in the world john 3:16 now look for it in the revised standard version of the bible it's thrown out as a fabrication as an interpolation i say here yeah. it is about time that we shook hand with these christian scholars this is thank thank you very much coming closer to islam the word that was greeting us they threw it out to appease us no because they found that it was not there in the original manuscripts this was somebody who had pushed it in it's not supposed to be there it's thrown out i have the bible here after the meeting if you like to check it up check it up the word begotten is not to be found another point of real difference between the muslim and the christian is this called thing called trinity the holy trinity where the christian says that the father is god the son is god and the holy ghost is god but there are not three gods but one god you remember the formula every christian has it on his lips this is the father is almighty the son is almighty and the holy ghost is almighty but there are not three almighties but one almighty he continues the father is a person the son is a person and the holy ghost is a person but there are not three person but one person i am asking the englishman what language are you speaking you say person 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 but not three person but one person what language is that oh of course that is the language of religion now the only solid basis on which this dogma could be based is to be found in the king james version and the roman catholic version of the bible in the first epistle of john chapter 5 verse 7 it reads for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one that is the clearest ex- approximation to the trinity in the christian bible now that also has been unceremoniously thrown out of this book by who not by muslim scholars not by jewish scholars not by hindu scholars but by 32 scholars christian scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations they threw it out as a fabrication 
it's not there. So I said, congratulations to you, my Christian learned men. So I'd like to kiss your hand. Look, they're coming to Islam. They're coming closer and closer to Islam. With regards to the crucifixion, with regards to the resurrection, we have given you a pamphlet when you came in. Jesus as only a messenger. At the back of that pamphlet, you will find a shock survey of Anglican bishops. A shock survey of Anglican bishops. These are paid servants of the Anglican Church. Men of the highest order of learning. The most respected people in Christendom among the Orthodox. In our daily news of the 25th of June this year, Dateline from London, it said, more than half of England's Anglican bishops say Christians are not obliged to believe that Jesus Christ was God. You are not obliged to believe that Jesus Christ is God. And this was a point of real difference between the Muslim and the Christian. They threw it out. They said, you, if you don't believe in that, you're still an Anglican. They don't want to lose you to Islam. Because that is what the real point of difference is. We say Jesus is not God. The Christians say Jesus is God. But more than half of the bishops now are telling you that you don't have to believe that Jesus is God. That means he is not God. It is not a foundation of your faith anymore. So I said, I take off my hat to these Anglican bishops, as we all ought to do. We take off our hat. What was the purpose? What was the motive? Which Arab Sheikh bribed these bishops. Tell me, who bribed them? To do away with the main, the bedrock of Christendom is the divinity of Christ. He said, look, you don't have to believe in that anymore. And further, in that same article, you read it at home, that the poll of 31 of England's 39 bishops show that many of them think that Christ's miracles, the virgin birth, and the resurrection might not have happened exactly as described in the Bible. These are something more like fairy tales. These are like fairy tales. It might not have happened. This resurrection of Jesus might not have happened. And we have given you a book. Free. Crucifixion or crucifixion. Absolutely free. And you read it and you can't help agreeing that it's a fiction. F-I-C-T-I-O-N fiction. Not F-I-X-I-O-N. F-I-C-T-I-O-N fiction. So these learned men of Christendom described in the Holy Quran as learned, that they are coming towards Islam. I say, congratulations, we take off our hat to you. And only 11 of the bishops insisted that Christians must regard Christ as both God and man, while 19 out of 31, work out the percentage at home, they said that Jesus Christ is nothing other than God's supreme agent. That's what we are saying. That is what the Quran says. Ya halal kitab, O people of the book, O learned people, la taqlu fi dinikum. He said, do not go to extremes in your religion. Wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. And don't say anything about God except the truth. Inna mal masih, most certainly the Messiah. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is the messenger of Allah. Look. This is what the Muslim is saying. He's a messenger of Allah. Now the Anglican bishops, 11 out of 31, they say that he, 19 out of 31, they say he's only a messenger. Now this, in this, there is a message for the Muslim. That it is about time that we shared Islam with our fellow countrymen. Look, the learned man, when he makes a discovery, he makes it known by the masses. They don't know what's going on. They are like sheep. They're still kept there in the stable. We have to free them, bring them over and say, look, these are your learned men. They are confessing without any coercion. There is no Muslim with a sword over his head. You remember that old saying that Islam was spread at the point of the sword? I said, which sword is forcing these people to tell you that whatever the Muslim says, they are agreeing with us, step by step, step by step, but they are dragging their feet. It is about time that we push them, rush them. So look, man, this is, what is the, now the difference between us and you? Whatever you said, the differences that existed, that create greater the Muslim, you have taken them out. 
You say you don't believe in them. So why not shake hands and become Muslims? In the words of the Holy Quran, I end this brief talk by saying, as we are made to say, Qul, tell them. Ya Ahlal Kitab, O people of the book, O learned people, O people with a scripture, Ta'alaw, come. Ila kalimatin sawaim bainana wa bainakum that we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And that common platform, this Almighty God, He gives it to us in this holy book. He says, Allah na'buda illa Allah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with Him. And that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, tell them that we at least are Muslims. We have submitted our will to the will of God. And we want you to join us in the fellowship of faith, in the brotherhood of faith. Thank you, Mr. Ahmad Didat. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be availed of the opportunity of putting questions to the speaker later. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Cunningham, who is now fondly known as Brother Jalaluddin, will address you, whereafter he will introduce the next speaker. Assalamu alaikum. Before I start saying what I have to say, if anybody wants refreshments, they're on my right at the back, they are available to you. Alhamdulillah, that means all praise is due to Allah. I am a revert. You may wonder what that is. Every child is born a Muslim. According to our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every child born is born a Muslim. And so, I too was born a Muslim. But sadly, my folks, my parents, who didn't know any better, taught me the faith of their fathers. They taught me Christianity. And I came to love the church that I belong to. I came to respect them. And I was raised up a Christian, and all my life I cherished the thought that one day I would pray and work for the church. I would become a priest. I worked hard. I studied hard. And I eventually did go to Rome. But as a young cleric, as a young seminarian, you question a great deal. You learn a lot of dogmas, you learn a lot of philosophies, and I began to question all the time about the oneness of God, the creator of this universe. But I still did not get enough information. I sometimes was a little bit of a headache to my professors, but alhamdulillah, they put up with me. On my return, after my ordination to the diaconate, I came back to South Africa, and one of my dearest friends was not at the airport to meet me. I was a little surprised and naturally disappointed. And when I arrived at the airport, my parents said they hadn't seen this fellow. His name was Carl. He was also going to become a priest in the Catholic Church. So I went around to see him. And he told me that he and I could no longer be friends. So I said, what's preventing you, be, you and I becoming friends, or p remaining friends? He said, well, I'm no longer a Catholic. I said, fine, if you're no longer a Catholic, that shouldn't prevent us from bringing friends. But if you're no longer a Catholic, what are you? He said, I'm a Muslim. I was stunned. I said, a Muslim? They're heathens. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Christ. Peace be upon him. He said he wasn't prepared to fight with me. He wasn't prepared to argue with me. He said, go along to the people who have taught me Islam and talk to them. So I said, who's done this to you? He said, Ahmed Didat. I said, that does it. 
I've had enough of this man, I'm going to see him. Which I did. Mr. Didat and Mr. Vanker and Mr. Khan were in the office in Madras Arcade and I went along. But it was an encounter of the Didat kind. I hadn't anticipated such a man. And within a short period of time, he proved to me, step by step, that there isn't a trinity. He revealed to me the simplicity and beauty of Allah's word in the Holy Quran. And eventually, one Juma, one Friday, which is our congregational day, I was a reciter of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, which means there is no object worthy of worship except Allah, and Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. It's very difficult when one becomes a revert, and to get back to the revert, very often we, f we imagine or we think that people are converts. Nobody converts to Islam. I said originally, everyone is born Muslim. We just go off the Surat al mustaqim we go off the straight path. So I reverted back onto the path of Islam. It was difficult, very, very, very difficult. The community I had left were not too happy with me. My family persecuted me. But it's understood. I think if I had a son or a daughter and they were to revert to another religion or convert other than, uh, to another religion other than Islam, I would naturally be upset. But Alhamdulillah, I found a new life in Canada. I went to live in Canada for a time and started a new practice. I had new friends, I had this new religion, but I was destined to come back. But in all this time that I was away, I wasn't practicing this new religion, this Islam. I was a Muslim, I'd recited the Kalima, but I wasn't practicing it. But now, Alhamdulillah, I'm a five-time Namazi, that means I make my Salah five times a day, and I'm full-time with the Islamic Propagation Center. I'm a missionary for Islam. Having gone to Canada and seen a very beautiful country, draws my attention to our guest speaker today, Gary Miller, who comes from Toronto in Canada. He's a Canadian citizen. He's a husband and father of two children. And we're indeed very, very fortunate to have him with us to spend this short period of time he is in South Africa because he has a very busy schedule. He travels a great deal throughout the world. In fact, he's on his way to Australia for the second time. And we have much in common. Canadian backgrounds, both Catholics, previous Catholics. He had the desire to become a priest, Catholic education, he had Jesuit education. I was also educated by the Jesuits in Rome. He, had, he was an altar boy. I was an altar boy. So we really had a lot to talk about yesterday when I met him. And we found out this common denominator. But I had gone from Catholicism to Islam. But Gary here went from Catholicism to something else. And I'm going to get him to tell you about that t shortly. And I would like you to give him a good hearing. His credentials are varied. He's a broadcaster. He appears on TV, appears on, at public lectures and on radio. He's an author. He's deserving of a good hearing. I'd like you to listen to him. I'd last, like you to ask him as many questions as you'd like. And now I call upon you, Gary Miller, to meet the people of Durban. Jazakallah. Uh, to my Muslim friends, assalamu alaikum. To Christian friends, peace be with you. They both mean the same thing as it happens. To everyone in general, welcome. Mr. Didat spoke, and of course he said some things that um, Christians probably don't like to hear. Uh, not necessarily because they're not 
true things. I mean, it is true that many of the bishops of the Church of England have said uh, Jesus is not divine. That, that's a fact they have said that. What is annoying to many Christians is to say, how could a man who calls himself a Christian say that? In any case, I too will say some things that will annoy people, some things that maybe Muslims don't want to hear, some things that maybe Christians don't want to hear. But ask yourself, is it because it wasn't true, or why does it bother me, if you don't like to hear what I've said? As uh, my friend has said, uh, we just got into a discussion, I met him for the first time, I believe it was only yesterday, we found out that we did at one time live within a few hundred miles of each other in Canada for a period of about six or eight years, but unless I bumped into him on the street, I don't remember ever meeting him until yesterday. He said that he went from Catholicism into Islam. I went from Catholicism toward the Protestant churches. Now, I have to clarify though first, don't misunderstand where we're going. I didn't come here at the invitation of a church. Mr. Didat asked me to come here, didn't pay me to come here. A couple of days after I got here, I asked him, who's paying for this trip? He said, we can't afford it. All right, that's the end of that. So nobody paid me to come here. I am invited from time to time to speak in churches, and sometimes I speak in mosques, and most often I simply speak at universities in open forums. You see, a lot of churches like what I say, and a lot of churches don't like what I say. Recently, I was speaking in Vancouver on the west coast of Canada, and when I finished my speech, somebody came up and told me how horrible it was. He said as a, a Christian, he was very offended by what he heard, and he was very upset. And another man right behind him came up, and he was a minister in the United Church of Canada. That's the largest denomination in Canada. He shook my hand. He said, that was beautiful. I want your name and address. I liked what you said. So you see, you can't ever paint all Christians with one brush. They come from one extreme to the other. Any two differences you can think of, there'll be people in between those two extremes. So please understand, some churches appreciate what I say, some do not. To clarify some terminology, I was surprised to find this morning I looked in the newspaper talking about things going on in the city today and it said Gary Miller is going to be speaking, an evangelist. Well. For years, in doing evangelical work with churches, preaching on the street corner or in a church or anywhere that I went, people would tell me, that's evangelism you're doing, you're an evangelist. And I used to tell them, I prefer you wouldn't use that word. Because as carefully as I've ever looked through the Bible, I never found the word evangelist on the lips of Jesus. I'm not saying it's a bad word. You want to call yourself an evangelist, be my guest. Me, I prefer not to always preferred not to because I didn't see Jesus use that word. That doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm just trying to take only what I ever saw that he said and he never used that word. I was surprised to hear yesterday that, where did he go? My friend here told me that uh, he got a phone call from somebody who wanted to know my credentials. By what authority and power did I speak about Islam and Christianity? I was kind of surprised to hear that. Uh, the caller said he was a Christian. It's a very unchristian thing to do. That's what the Jews and the Romans and so on used to ask about the disciples of Jesus. You find in Acts chapter 4, among other places, when the disciples would try to preach, the Romans or the Jews would say, by what authority do you preach? What school did you go to? You're just a fisherman. How do you dare to speak? So I'd hope that's not typical of most people, that they seem to think a Christian today has to be like a Pharisee. He has to go through the school and get a certificate and he's approved. I can give you credentials like that if you want, but I'd be ashamed to lower myself to that level. Now, please understand, no matter what you think you hear me say, I am trying to help the Christian missionary, all right? Somebody told me a few minutes ago, you can't help the Christian missionary if you stand on the same platform with Ahmadidat. I'm trying to help the Christian missionary. Listen carefully. A lot of people don't see it that way, of course. Because a lot of people, Muslims and Christians alike, they want to drink milk all their lives. 
See, if you give a baby milk and you keep giving him milk, he'll get bigger and bigger, but suppose you never gave him anything else but milk. After some time, he starts to get sick. There comes a time when you need meat and fruit and vegetables. Paul wrote that in one of his letters. It's in the Bible. He said, let's go beyond the milk. He said, we've got to get into the meat. See, most of the, the Christian community and the Muslim community alike, they want to come and go to their meetings on a weekly basis and hear the same old thing over and over. Don't forget to pray, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and so on. They never want any meat. You see, this is milk. We all know this. We have to go beyond this sometimes. When I say I'm trying to help the missionary, I'm talking about this. I'm saying to the missionary, you want to convert the Muslim to Christianity? But look what you're doing instead. You say you're trying to convert the Muslim. You write books, you have speeches and so on. You want to convert the Muslim. Instead of converting the Muslim, look what you're doing because of what you say. You see, the missionary wants the Muslim to start thinking. So he asks him some questions. He has discussions and so on. He plants little seeds. He wants the Muslim to start thinking. But the missionary does not tell the Muslim what to think. He just wants him to start thinking. He doesn't tell him what to think because the missionary usually hasn't thought about it himself. Now, if that sounds serious, let me illustrate what I'm getting at by a few examples. The missionary says to the Muslim, does the Quran say that Jesus was sinless? The Muslim says, yes, perfect man, never sinned. And the missionary says, does the Quran tell Muhammad to repent? And the Muslim says, yes, it tells him to repent. And that's all. The missionary doesn't say anything else. He hopes now the Muslim is going to start thinking, well, now, wait a minute. Jesus never sinned, but Muhammad was supposed to repent. Maybe Jesus is better. He's hoping, but he doesn't dare say that. Because if he says that, if he says, do you know, a sinless man is better than a repentant sinner. If he dares to say that, he goes exactly against the teachings of Jesus. If he's foolish enough to say that, he goes exactly against the teachings of Jesus. My advice to Muslims, if somebody asks you those questions, you ask him to tell you the story of the prodigal son. Everybody knows the story in the Bible. You say, the story of the prodigal son, the young man who told his father, give me the money that I would get when you die. I want it now. And then he ran away and he spent it on terrible things. Ask him to tell you that story and tell you what is the lesson of that story. Because the lesson of that story involves the complaint of the other brother in the family, the good son. When the evil son came back and repented, the father welcomed him. And the good son complained. He said, I've never done anything wrong. And yet, look how you treat my brother, who was so bad. And his father told him how wrong an attitude that was. He said, your brother was dead, now he's alive. You see, the perfect man does not have any preference over the sinless man or the repentant sinner in Christianity. Make the missionary tell you the story of the lost sheep. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, it starts. Jesus said, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. Jesus was trying to hammer that point home to his disciples, saying, don't you dare say because, for example, you've been a faithful follower for many years, that you're better than this one who just became a believer yesterday. The perfect man has no precedence over the repentant sinner. In fact, this whole argument would not exist if both Muslims and Christians were better aware of the meaning of the word sin, but that's another story and we don't have time for. To illustrate again, the missionary says to the Muslim, was Jesus the Messiah? And the Muslim says, yes. And the missionary says, was Muhammad the Messiah? And the Muslim says, no. There he stops again, hoping the Muslim will go away and think, now, wait a minute, Jesus is Messiah, but Muhammad isn't. Maybe Jesus is better. Well, what you want to ask the missionary is about this word Messiah. Ask him. 
Jesus was the Messiah, but were there any other Messiahs besides Jesus? Now you find out how well he knows his Bible, because there were many. David, Solomon, even Cyrus the Persian were called Messiah. It's hard to find that in the Bible because the translators cover it over. They translate the word. Messiah means anointed, somebody picked to do a job. Somebody single out said, you are the one. Every king of ancient Israel was called Messiah. Now the name doesn't look quite so special anymore. It is a title, but it does not particularly elevate to some divine status. I'm trying to show you that the arguments are not good enough that are being used and I see in print all the time. The missionary asks the Muslim, where is the body of Jesus? And the Muslim says, God took it. And the missionary says, where is the body of Muhammad? And the Muslim says, it's in Medina, in the ground. The missionary stops, hoping the Muslim will go away and think, now that's interesting. The body of Jesus is gone. Muhammad is in the grave. Maybe Jesus is the true messenger. Muhammad is false. He's hoping you'll think that, but he dare not say it. Because what you want to ask the missionary, is that what you mean to say? Do you mean that a dead and buried prophet is a false prophet? Is that what you mean? Make him finish it. Because if that's what he means, what does he say about Abraham, for example? Or in Arabic they say Ibrahim. Jews and Muslims till now still go to the place where he's buried to visit his grave. Is he a false prophet because he's dead and in the ground? For that matter, where is the body of Moses? The Bible says God took it. He sent an angel to take the body away. What does it prove? What disturbs me most, I guess, because even now we're seeing finally a, a turnaround in the Pentecostal churches where for years the Pentecostal insisted you are saved not by works but by your faith. Pentecostal church is starting to finally put the two together. No, it's faith and works side by side. What the missionary has always accused the Muslim of is to say, you people believed you're saved by works alone. And they quote the Quran. In the 32nd chapter of the Quran, the 19th verse, or ayah, it says, if you'll excuse my terrible Arabic, Amaladina amanu wa amalu salihat falahum janatul mawa nuzalan bima kanu ya'maloon. Which means, and for those who believe and do good works, for them, gardens, a refuge, and entertainment for what they used to do. They quote this verse saying, you see, Muslims believe they're saved by works alone. Somehow, the word is there in print, they don't see it. It says, emanu wa emelu salihat. Emanu, they believe wa emelu salihat, and they do good works. They believe and they do good works. The two are together. You see, in the Arabic language, the word only has to change a little bit, and it becomes a different part of speech. Emanu means they believe. Iman, made from the same letters, means what you believe, your belief, your faith. What this verse is saying is you've got to have faith and works side by side. Not one, not the other, but both. Which is exactly what is found in the Bible, in the little book of James, especially the second chapter of the little book of James. Now the Protestant reformers at first didn't like James very much. Martin Luther said it was an epistle of straw. Blow it away. Didn't like it. In the second chapter of James, he makes the point several times, particularly in the 26th verse, he says to the Christian community, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead.